Oh yeah, bullshit. Uh, you can go home with some new information um, how to help our patients. Um, so to give a state of the art uh, endoscopy lecture, we have to talk about disruptive innovations. Uh, what is a disruptive innovation? It is a novel procedure that changed the current standard of care. It leads to fundamental change in our practice and may change the way we think about problems and improves the way we, uh, the things are currently done. Uh, we had some um, brown, uh, groundbreaking um, revelations and innovations in uh, diagnostic endoscopy already that you're familiar with. Video capsule endoscopy took us to the land that we never even dreamed of uh, exploring to the deep into the small bowel. We can do um, deep endoscopy and cover all of that uh, area that uh, we did not have access to get into. Uh, we do advanced imaging, and although MR MRCP is not a really endo endoscopic procedure, it's really changed the way we think about uh, the biliary system and uh, significantly reduced the need for us to do um, really diagnostic ERCPs. So what are the three things, th three major areas that I see as um, innovative um, and um, changing in the landscape of tropical endoscopy includes uh, eradication of the GI neoplasms, anti-reflux treatments, and bariatrics. And I wanted to go over them with you and bring you up to date where we are standing. Starting with the GI neoplasms, um, we, um, starting from top going bottom, um, Barrett's esophagus, a precancerous condition that depending on the degree of uh, dysplasia can cause um, three to nine percent per year uh, risk of development of esophageal cancer. Uh, not too long ago, uh, the standard of care for patients with Barrett's was uh, transhiatal esophagectomy. If surgery uh, with 30 percent a chance of complication, including some devastating leaks causing mediastinitis, pneumonia, PEs, uh, usually patients would stay in the hospital seven days. Uh, two months for them to recover from this such uh, procedure and it takes almost to a year or so to uh, adjust to not having the esophagus and dealing with the stomach in the chest um, working as an esophagus. Um, since that was a major problem, um, uh, we uh, did uh, have some um, uh, make some headways as far as endoscopic treatments. On the video, you can see the um, Barrett's esophagus as a salmon colored tongues in the lower part of the esophagus. And nowadays, we can deal with the uh, Barrett's esophagus uh, through the scope uh, without the need for surgery. The first uh, modality that um, is probably um, uh, one of the most uh, uh, useful modalities because not only we can eradicate the Barrett's but also we can get a final tissue diagnosis and know exactly what was the degree of the problem, was there any cancer or not, is bad ligation. So basically these um, the surface of the Barrett's will be uh, suctioned and make uh, little polyps projections that will be snared off and as you can see in the video all of the Barrett's have been uh, removed and um, the muscle layer underneath is exposed. Uh, this is what some people uh, refer to as minimally invasive esophagectomy. And uh, depending on the degree of Barrett's, we can remove all or part of the Barrett's that looks suspicious. Uh, removing is not the only option. We can also burn the Barrett's. Uh, we usually use radio frequency ablation modality. It's a microwave um, heat energy that will be um, delivered through the catheters that are inserted through the mouth and basically goes uh, down the esophagus and um, with the heat therapy, the Barrett's uh, mucosa will be ablated uh, with a predicted depth of uh, injury. At the end, uh, we can uh, also we have the uh, freeze therapies uh, using a cryo spray. So we have three major uh, modalities, we can resect, uh, burn, or freeze, and get rid of the Barrett's esophagus. Now, uh, what are the outcomes? Uh, we now have uh, the good long-term data showing that we are successful around 90% uh, long-term. 
Uh, we know there are some recurrence for the Barrett's, but almost all of those recurrences can be treated again endoscopically. We have avoided a large surgery, and uh, it is very well tolerated with a good um, outcome uh, perforation risk, less than 1%, and structure formation, which is probably the, lot, the biggest uh, problem that can happen, can easily be uh, treated endoscopically. So what is the new standard of the care? The guidelines currently do not uh, promote surgical interventions for um, Barrett's with high-grade dysplasia or even early esophageal cancer and endoscopic treatments including resection, burning or freezing are considered the new standard of care. Going down, uh, in, uh, in colon, we know that uh, colonoscopy has been uh, really made a big impact as far as the uh, way uh, the incident of colorectal, or colorectal um, in this country for the past 20 years that we are doing a screening colonoscopy. Uh, the, the rate of colon cancer uh, each year has dropped 3% per year. So. Um, Yes, this is a screening procedure, but this is not any screening procedure like the rest of screening procedures like mammograms or um, pap smears. This is not only finding cancer, this is preventing cancer. The problem happens is that if there is a large polyp that was found during one of these procedures, usually the standard of care was surgical resection. So these are generally large polyps, still not cancer, or maybe even um, early cancer in these polyps. Um, the, the surgical resection of the colon is not as dramatic as um, total esophagectomy for Barrett's, but still carries 3 to 15 percent of anastomotic leak that can be catastrophic. And uh, the hospital stay, abdominal abscess, ileus, and so on related to any surgery. Currently, we have um, a wide field EMR, basically, which is a technique that we inject um, uh, solutions under the uh, mucosa, uh, protecting the deeper layers of the, uh, the, of the colon, and with uh, special instruments, depending on the technique, with the use of snares, we basically uh, start uh, the process of piecemeal resection of these uh, polyps. And as you can see um, in the video, um, piece by piece these um, um, polyps will be removed and um, the patient does not require any further surgical intervention all, all of the polyps will be removed uh, basically with, the, with this technique um, it is safe um, it, more than 90% technical um, success and um, Surgery, mainly up to 90% of the cases, have been avoided. Again, the chance of uh, problems with these techniques are uh, low. Perforation, less than um, 1%, and bleeding can happen up to 5%, but most of those are, again, endoscopically treatable. Um, er gastric uh, cancer and early gastric uh, neoplasms are not uh, very common uh, in the um, United States, uh, but uh, in Asian populations, uh, we have techniques that we can resect and um, suture and close and remove um, precancers and early cancers of the esophagus. So the takeaway message is that I think um, in 2017 for a benign neoplasm of the um, GI tract, um, hopefully we are not sending our patients to surgery as the first mortality. Uh, we try to remove them endoscopically and only if failed or not possible, then go to the surgical route. Uh, the second big uh, subject that is um, you heard er earlier this morning as well is uh, treatment of, uh, of reflux. Um, regardless of what you would uh, like to take away from the uh, literature, uh, you believe the side effects or not, uh, we know uh, that PPIs are not uh, perfect. They do carry uh, 30 to 40 percent of patients on PPIs are still symptomatic and the symptoms that uh, comes from the PPIs are very um, um, very obvious because um, reflux is a regurgitation disease, it's not an acid disease. By reducing acid you are 
putting a uh, band-aid on the problem, but you're not really um, tackling the underlying problem. That being aside, uh, there are people that does not respond, they have side effects, um, they lose response, or they have um, a problem with breakthrough symptoms. So in those patients that are not, uh, they are failing in the, uh, the medical therapy, the traditional standard of care considered to be fund application. Um, the fund application is a surgical uh, procedure. It has been perfected over the last hundred years. It's an effective procedure. But still, it is a, a invasive. It, it, um, it can be done uh, laparoscopically in hand, hands of good uh, surgeon. Um, the problem that happens is that uh, not only there uh, is risk of surgery, there are risk of uh, um, symptoms related to the surgery, such as gas flow, diarrhea, not being able to vomit. And uh, the biggest problem is failed uh, fund application. Unfortunately, we know that None of the medical interventions that we do are lasting forever. Um, in, that includes also fund, uh, surgical fund application and this risk that um, success of a re repeat uh, fundoplasty usually is uh, very low and it is very challenging. The latest data that came out was from a big uh, uh, registry, in, uh, Swedish uh, registry, more than uh, 2,000 patients that were followed five years after fund application. Um, this showed that 17% uh, of patients uh, reflux returned, and 16% of them required a second surgery. Um, we also know that um, lots of the patients, unfortunately, after fund application, still go back on uh, PPI. This was a high number, 83% of them. So what are the uh, endoscopic options? Uh, there are, we can do fundoplasty uh, through the scope. Uh, there are two uh, uh, transmural fundoplasty systems available, uh, transoral um, incisionless fundoplasty, or TIF. Uh, on the center and uh, the MUSE procedure on the left side, both of these um, basically create um, a fundoplasty uh, such as uh, one has been done uh, surgically. Um, and the oldest option that we have available is uh, Streta, which does not do a fundoplasty but with um, deployment of the radio frequency ablation. Uh, radio frequency uh, thermal uh, it stimulates the uh, formation and uh, regeneration of the muscle fibers in the lower esophageal sphincter. How are the um, data as far as the, um, the, these pr uh, procedures? All of these are new. The longest data is uh, re uh, related to strata. There are three meta-analysis. Uh, the first meta-analysis that included um, uh, 1,400 patients um, that showed um, improved hardware scores uh, and also um, esophageal acid exposure time were decreased with a um, statistically significant p-value. Uh, this was very promising. Unfortunately, it was followed by a second meta-analysis done by Dr. Richter uh, um, choosing four studies. Um, um, GIs probably know Dr. Richter, he's done some good contributions, but he's not advanced endoscopies and for uh, some reason against um, any endoscopic procedure in this matter. So after cherry picking four studies, uh, he, sh he uh, declared that there is no effect with strata. Um, but the recent, most recent meta-analysis, uh, including uh, more than 2,000 uh, patients, from 28 centers just published, and it shows clearly that um, Strata can improve the quality of life index, uh, reducing heartburn, uh, reduce esophagitis, and also acid exposure time. Uh, this has been led to many states, unfortunately Florida is not one of them, approving um, uh, Strata as one of the endoscopic treatments for uh, uh, GERD and uh, paying for it by the commercial insurance. The same data is available for um, um, endoscopic fundoplasties, uh, especially TIF. There are multiple uh, randomized controlled uh, placebo um, 
uh, versus uh, versus TIF and the recent meta uh, analysis in the uh, last year's D uh, DDW, uh, including three of these uh, control studies, showed that uh, six months post procedure uh, there were improvement in the GERD health related quality of life index. Uh, reduction in the distal esophageal acid exposure time and esophagitis. So we are making some headway. Uh, this is not still uh, to the degree that uh, we have it for an um, ablation and resection of um, in the um, neoplastic process, such that you saw in the earlier part of the study, but for sure. Uh, there is a role for endoscopic treatments. Uh, we know there is a cascade of events uh, leads to uh, worsening of the geometry of the GE junction that controls the acid reflux and we, we find the patients in the right spot before the uh, formation of a large hyal hernia. Um, there, there are patients that can be treated uh, helped to come off of their PPI and their get their quality of life improved. The last topic is about um, the bariatric um, options. Um, obviously, unfortunately, uh, obesity is becoming a national problem. This is the latest data that we have from 2014-2016. In uh, white adults, you can see that um, rate of um, BMI uh, less than 35 is increasing, especially in the middle states. But if you take this to the um, African American adults, you can see a devastating um, chart that basically more than half of the country has more than 35, uh, 35 BMI. Um, uh, the standard of care for the patients that have been failed lifestyle modifications or uh, surgical interventions. Um, we really, uh, we originally um, basically categorized these surgeries as restrictive versus malabsorptive. Uh, the restrictive options, the least uh, invasive one is a lap band. Uh, unfortunately, has lots of complications. Seven percent of patients have. Uh, GI symptoms and uh, most of them um, uh, there is, remain so symptomatic that the band needs to be removed. Uh, one option, a vertical band, gastro, uh, gastro, um, 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 gastric band has been um, basically removed from the uh, market because of the up to 50% uh, chance of um, complications. And those have been replaced by rural Y gastric bypass surgery, uh, which has a component of malabsorptive uh, because of the uh, bypass of part of this uh, duodenum. And uh, more commonly now, uh, in sleeve gas uh, gastrectomy. Yeah, sleeve gastrectomy probably is the best op surgical option that we have right now, but still up to 10% of patients have significant GI symptoms afterwards. Um, and the duodenal switch surgery is not even done anymore. Uh, that was probably the most effective as far as the weight loss, but uh, with uh, so many complications that uh, is not done anymore. So if you want to look at the options, uh, we have low risk, low effect options, which is our usual lifestyle changes and medications. Uh, we have the high uh, risk, high uh, um, effect procedures. The, those are usually your surgical procedures. Uh, the best of them is that we did all switch, which is not done, but probably sleep gastrectomy and gastric bypass. And now we are having some intraluminal bariatric procedures that can be done incisionless uh, through uh, endoscopy. Um, the um, societies, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy and American Society of Metabolic uh, Bariatric Surgery came with some guidelines as far as giving us some um, a pathway as far as the efficacy and safety threshold for these procedures. Uh, they would like to see that um, excess weight loss of 25% after 12 months of such procedure with uh, at least 15% um, improvement uh, versus controls and uh, they would like any of these procedures that be done uh, to be have at least uh, less than 5% uh, chance of complications. Uh, although I have to say this is a big uh, threshold to achieve, especially as far as the side effects, 
when you compare it to the surgical options. The first um, option that became FDA approved based on uh, more than 200 um, patients that were um, underwent a randomized control study was the Obera balloon. Um, where, um, this data uh, showed that uh, patients uh, lost basically up to 35% uh, uh, of um, excess weight loss during the six months and this was maintained to 20% after 12 months and the uh, balloon became um, uh, FDA approved. Uh, the balloon is uh, approved for six months so after six months it needs to be removed and removal is um, uh, endoscopically. There are some uh, other balloons that uh, have right after have been um, FDA approved. Uh, uh, reshaped dual balloon and also set three um, intragastric balloons are some of the other endoscopically placed uh, balloons that are available. Um, with the interest in the gastric balloons coming, uh, there are some uh, options that are now available that do not require endoscopy for the placement of the balloon and they can stay uh, longer uh, up to 12 months. Um, intragastric O balloon uh, which you can see the patient basically swallows a balloon uh, that is attached to a tread and uh, under fluoroscopy you will uh, visualize after it's in the stomach you inflate the balloon and detach the, um, the catheter that uh, basically inflated the balloon. Um, the um, the intragastric um, Air-filled balloons are not as effective as uh, fluid-filled balloons that we have. Uh, they usually, for achieving good uh, success, you need to place at least three of these balloons, which can add to the cost. And uh, but um, the data is very promising, and it's showing even after 24 of uh, 24 weeks of uh, um, placement of the balloon after removal of them. Of uh, after 12 weeks, uh, the weight loss will be uh, sustained. Um, the other area of, uh, of investigation and also interest is uh, transoral sleeve, uh, sleeve gastroplasty. Uh, this, uh, there are some endoscopically, uh, endoscopic suturing devices that are now available that we use uh, for treating perforations, fistulas, and uh, over stitches, one of those um, um, devices. Um, few centers in the country uh, basically developed a, a protocol as far as uh, doing a transoral sleeve gastroplasty with this device with some um, um, uh, success depending on the center and the expertise. But the problem is that this is very um, uh, operator dependent. Uh, in the hand of a uh, skilled um, advanced endoscopist, you can achieve better results than the others. Uh, therefore, some other companies are investigating and in, um, making some a newer device. For example, TOGA or trans oral gastroplasty device is a special over the tube device that has been de designed to go over the scope and basically uh, creating a transoral uh, uh, sleeve uh, gastrectomy. And the newest um, of the bunch is the primary obesity surgery in the luminal hose uh, procedure, which is a very robust um, 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 uh, scope and platform uh, for uh, performing transoral um, sleeve gastroplasty. Uh, probably um, these options, you will hear from them um, more in the future and uh, will be gaining more um, attraction from the FDA side. Uh, and the reason is that um, unlike the gastric balloons, uh, these are permanent, uh, considering there is a failure associated with them, but there is no need to go and retrieve the balloons after the deployment. And um, especially with uh, hose, uh, which is a very robust uh, transmural um, endo, um, endoscopic surgery, uh, you can really decrease this volume of the stomach and um, achieve a good uh, weight loss uh, with this procedure. There are uh, some malabsorptive uh, options also FDA approved and available currently in the, uh, in the market. Uh, aspiration therapy, which uh, with Aspire Assist is an option, 
uh, this is a uh, this can be an attractive uh, option for some patients because they can continue to eat what they want uh, after they ate they basically um, would go to um, the bathroom and they have a um, sort of a peg tube uh, higher caliber um, a tube that goes to their stomach and they basically empty whatever they ate and purge out. Uh, might be not the best option as far as the statistically, uh, but um, uh, it's FDA approved and available. There are some other malabsorptive options that have been explored. Um, endobarrier was a um, protective um, membrane that was placed endoscopically through the antrum uh, covering the small intestine. Um, um, the studies did not show a robust uh, number as far as decrease of the weight, but um, uh, they actually showed more improvement in the diabetes and uh, blood sugar control in patients with diabetes, and the European market have approved this as actually a treatment for diabetes. And all, uh, we have other options that are uh, not really available, but basically um, using the same endolumina barrier uh, treatments instead of going from the duodenum, going from the stomach, basically uh, creating anatomies comparable to, um, to uh, gastric bypass surgery. So uh, these are the three major areas that I see that innovative um, endoscopic procedures are coming and um, I hope that uh, we know about them, take advantage of them and with that I will conclude my talk and if there is any question I'll be happy to answer. Please.